Welcome. I'm so excited uh, for us to have the opportunity to present this next panel um, on the Shine on San Francisco Action Awards. And so I just want to take a minute. Um, I'm Philip Wynn. I'm the director of Parks and Place at the San Francisco Parks Alliance. San Francisco Parks Alliance is a, is a key partner in the Shine on SF initiative. Um, and we're so excited to see the way that um, Shine on SF has really been evolving over the last two years. Um, and, and the action awards that you're gonna learn about and hear about today are a really important next step in that evolution. And so just for those of you who may not be uh, so familiar with Shine on SF, I just wanna take a minute to uh, introduce, this is an initiative that started, was uh, founded by, by two incredible visionary members of our community, Howard Wolner and Jennifer Kiss, who's actually here today, Jennifer, um, and with the support of an incredible cross-cutting uh, coalition of partners inside and outside of government, representing uh, you know, multiple agencies within city government, the mayor's office, uh, the nonprofit community, um, private philanthropy and others, really all coming together for the simple idea of how can we create a clean and cared for San Francisco. Um, and the strategies for doing that are, are cross-cutting as well. And so there have been groups working on how to improve how we um, dispatch 311 services as part of our cleaning and sanitation working group. Um, and really the work that you're gonna see here today has evolved out of what's called the activation and beautification stream of work within Shine on SF. And so uh, I had the, the great honor along with my colleague Julie Flynn here to co-chair a working group over the last couple of years with uh, an, a great representation of uh, public realm and arts and culture and community organizations from across San Francisco to try and answer this question of how can we have activities and opportunities for community members to engage with the public realm in San Francisco and make a difference in their own way? How do we increase the agency for people to say, I, I want to help, but I don't quite know how, or I might be frustrated because of the sense that the bureaucracy of the city is very difficult to navigate. And really all the work that we've been doing has been oriented towards saying, how do we understand those obstacles? How do we try and diminish them? And how do we rally a city of caretakers? Because as many of you already here represent, San Francisco has an extraordinary history of community-based stewardship of public spaces and of advocacy for public spaces and the public realm in general. And I think a great intuition about how these things are inextricably linked with um, the health of our entire society. And so, you know, what's really cool to see and, and that I, I'm personally very proud of is that we took the great advice of several members of that working group when we were just getting started, and this is in, in the early months of the pandemic. And we had a lot of different ideas flying around the virtual room. And, and a couple of very wise women in the room said, if this initiative has any chance of being successful, you have to start by listening. Um, and, you know, many of us took that very much to heart and we had the opportunity to develop a series of projects that, that I hope some of you have seen. If you've not, please visit the Shine on SF social media feeds and the website and learn about our Golden Trees and Love Letters projects, which were um, a, a series of public art projects, but really also a citywide community engagement exercise and a citywide listening exercise where we asked individuals across the city in many, many sites over the course of more than a year, the simple question, what makes San Francisco shine? And we, at this point, have collected more than 5,000 individual responses to that question, and they really have become a soulful guiding light for us in thinking about what we should do next. And the, the thing that bubbled up from that work more than anything else was an understanding that connecting specific people with specific neighborhood scale public spaces where they wanted to make a difference is probably where we could have some of the biggest possible impact. And that's really what this Action Awards program um, represents and what the panel today is gonna you know, help to give you a taste of where we're headed and where our focus is really gonna be now over the course of the next year with Shine on SF in figuring out the ways that we can create better access, better agency, and this, um, you know, funding opportunity 
for community-based groups to do something quickly um, and to do something impactful that we can all learn from and build on. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Julie to lead the rest of the panel and to hear from uh, representatives from a bunch of our exciting pilot projects we've been working with over the last couple of months. So thanks all so much. Thank you, Philip. Um, I might just stand. Um, so my name is Julie Flynn. I um, work at the city's Office of Economic and Workforce Development, and I've been a project manager helping develop this grant program as part of a team. Um, I'll introduce our panelists briefly, and then they can say who they are when they present their projects a little in a little more detail. But just the kind of highest level, what the concept for these action awards is, um, is to really as we think about, we're, you know, we're emerging from COVID. We need to reconnect people with each other in public space. We need to reconnect people with the public spaces they love. For many people, public spaces are what got them through the pandemic, and it's a moment to kind of want to, you know, give more care and love and use those spaces with love. So the idea here is it's resources to people or organizations to care for a public space um, that matters to them. Now, what that looks like could really vary, and I think you'll see, and I hope be inspired by what these panelists have done with these pilot grants. Um, we're down one today uh, due to COVID, unfortunately. Lucas um, will have to click through his slides quickly. He couldn't attend um, because of the of a COVID exposure here, but we are excited to have with us today Patricia Algara from With Honey in the Heart Pollinator Garden. We have Lisa Rogovin, who's representing the neighbors of Cuvier Commons. And finally, Angelina Polselli from Manny's Cafe. And their projects are very diverse. You'll hear a lot more from them in just a moment. Um, I'm just gonna do a few quick points to kind of orient you at a high level to the program, and then we'll dive into their work. So thank you all for being here with us today. So we really tried to develop this program through piloting, um, true to this title of the Action Awards, um, kind of not just sit in a room and, and think about what it could be, but kind of do this in community together with, with a diverse range of projects. So um, what we're kind of looking at as, as the program launches this summer um, is, as we said, you know, awards of resources to help people or organizations, and, and that part's important. We know that not everybody has a 501c3. You might just be getting started as a non-formalized community group, and we want these funds to be available to you. So that's an important aspect. Um, project types we're looking for are small-scale recurring programming. Um, it, this could be events, gatherings, cleanups, a lot of times linking them. You know, we know that doing something beautiful or, you know, having a fun event in a public space is just part of it. If it's also full of trash or weeds, that's not going to feel great, right? So a lot of groups are kind of taking on both of these challenges at once, and you'll see that uh, come through in these projects. The award itself consists of some funding. It could be up to $5,000, and then also technical assistance and staff hours to help you implement and get that done. What that looks like will really vary by your project. In some cases, you might be a pro at permitting and you need help marketing. Someone else might have never tried to pull a city permit before and their project requires it. And so that's what they're looking for some help with. So we're trying to kind of work with each of the grantee to provide some of that staffing too. Um, so that's kind of the overview of, of what the program is emerging to be. We developed this through, we, we piloted with six organizations and, and projects in different parts of the city, um, you know, ranging from a business owner, a merchant group, to a neighborhood group, and, and kind of different types of public spaces. Like you said, you'll hear from four today, but there were a few others, just so you have a sense. And what we're hoping you'll be inspired today um, to do is to think about applying yourself or share the program with someone that you know. Um, we've we're looking to kind of formally launch this in June. So coming up really soon, we'll have a call for projects. Um, up on the slide, I think sort of just repeats what I was saying here, but this is a sense of what we'd be looking for in that call for projects. Um, I think just we'll put at the end our website and our social media handles. That is where you'll find out about it when it launches. So um, I think to give a little more color to the program, I'm just gonna hand it over to our panelists now, and then at the end we'll have some time for questions, and we can talk about um, any, anything that's come up for you or anything that inspired you. So I'm gonna hand it over to Patricia. You can advance, just click down. Oh, you know what, sorry. I'm just gonna very quickly click through uh, for you. Um, Lucas's slides, it was gonna be so inspiring. Cleanups and story times. I don't wanna take his, uh, his words though, so we'll hand it over to Patricia. 
I wish you could be here. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in spirit, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> I worry, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to try to take his, uh, take his, <laughs> his talking points, so. Uh, so, I am Patricia Algara, I'm the founder of With Honey in the Heart. It's a project that mostly focuses on trying to transform underutilized spaces in the city and take out lawn or, you know, just places that have weeds and transform that into thriving, healthy habitat for pollinators, mostly focusing on drought tolerant plants and plants that can really support the um, harsh environments of the city. So our Pollinator Boulevard on Dolores Street is the pilot project for this. And the idea came uh, during the drought when the median, this is the median right on Dolores. Um, and where we started is at Dolores and Market Street, that, those first two medians. It stopped being irrigated and so it looked kind of sad, so I reached out to the city and I said, you know, couldn't we imagine something else different here that would be more about giving life and habitat for the bees? And imagine what that could be if we did it for the whole stretch of Dolores, which is right in the middle of the city. Like, that's a lot of land. This is a wide median and it's not really, it cannot be used for other things. Like, it's not a park. It can't be used for playing in the turf. So can it become a beautiful space for pollinators? So we've done the first two blocks, you can see in the yellow at the very top, but there's a lot more space to do. And we imagine what that could be because we think that it's really important to create this habitat for bees in the urban environment, giving that outside of the cities, it's not healthy for bees or for any other beings for that matter because of industrial agriculture and monocultures and pesticides, etc. So cities have the opportunity to become havens for pollinators. So we started looking at the first median, we thought let's plant it like a rainbow because it's the entry point to the Castro and having this really beautiful rainbow planting. But then the plants arrived on a cold winter day that was raining with no labels. And there was no way, like it was really difficult to identify the plants. <laughs> so. It became um, a little bit different. We also have this, this is a, we selected the plants based on a year round blooming and um, source of nectar for bees. So this is how we started. We sheet mulched the whole medians to eradicate the, the grass that had been there for you know 40 years. So that's a hard thing to do, but we started by doing that. We left that for a couple months, I think six months. And that was our first community day, just doing the sheet mulching. And then we came back when the rain started. So we did that in the summer, left it, just try to eradicate the weeds for six months, came back in the summer, planted the first plants. You can see this, like the plants are hard to identify and had no labels. And so it didn't, it wasn't quite the rainbow that we imagined. It's become something different, but we've learned a lot of lessons from that. Um, this is our sign and we've tried it and this is how it looked like you know after some time and you can see that we planted a lot of native plants like we, the yarrows and other ones and some of those didn't survive it's a very windy site we have a lot of um, trash and problems and like i said we learned some things about the first median so in the second median our planting focus on having the bigger plants at the center of the median. You can see there like the, the big plants are in the middle and the smaller, the more ground covers go on the edge to make it easier to uh, go around in water and also for cars to be able to turn around and see uh, what's happening on the other side. So we changed our planting plan and we also adjusted to some plants that uh, we noticed were more um, easy to survive. So this is the two medians that we've done so far, but as I mentioned, the challenge of wind and trash. We're right, we have Whole Foods right there and Safeway right there, and just a wind tunnel from market that enters. So all of that trash from those two stores and market gets collected in our plants. It's 
um, it's really difficult to keep up with all that trash and the wind and, and honestly just the abuse of people walking through there. We had a car drive by, we've had a lot of trash, someone burned all of our sage one time, I don't know why, maybe it just needed some cleansing. Uh, <laughs> but the sage has thrived, has come back. Um, you know, of course, trash, like a lot of things get left behind. Uh, this is the other medians you've seen in, in some ways, you know, it has helped to, like this is the other medium which became a, an encampment in our medium because it was planted, it didn't provide that habitat. So that, that was a good thing. Um, but you can see, you know, this is how it looks like people have started walking by and created their own paths through the site, which is okay, you know, we understand that that was gonna happen. So now what we want to look at is, is this actually working? Is it actually bringing bees? Is, this, is it a good habitat? And what we have found, we work with an entomologist with UC Berkeley. She did a study over a whole year to identify who's coming to the site. And we did have 11 species of native bees come to the site, which is pretty exciting, <laughs> considering, right, that is like right in the middle of two busy intersections in the middle of the city. And I was told, like, no, no native bees will come to a uh, busy transit. Well, they have come. So I am a strong believer that if you build it, they will come. Uh, and so there's also butterflies and hummingbirds, uh, raccoons, rats, of course, all kinds of habitat, beautiful habitat that comes by. So we have some big plans for the next medians with what we've learned. And what, right now what we're doing is a post-occupancy evaluation to see which plants have survived and which ones are doing really well. So this is our analysis of median one and median two and identifying which ones are the ones that are surviving the best so that we can think about using those plants for the future medians. We have stopped irrigating altogether now after five years of the plants being established. So they're fully um, on their own now. And it, the, 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 the how it looks, how the median looks changes. It looks really good in the spring, after it rains, it's beautiful, blooming, thriving, all the, the seeds come up, and then towards the end of the summer, it starts looking a little sad because it's going into hibernation. And, but that's natural, and I think it's, you know, I get a lot of hate mail sometimes about why am I not taking care of this garden, it's dying, but it's not dying, right? It's about learning that this is a living organism that sometimes doesn't look like it should because it's, how we're imagined that it should look like. Because it's a living organism, it's, it's going into hibernation, but the plants will come back, and we, you know these are the plants that will come back, which is great. So we also have a few uh, pokey plants throughout, which was a request from the community to prevent um, encampments and other things. And thank you so much, here's my information. If you wanna reach out, please do. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia, and I just wanna, um, say I had the chance to go out to your site and I think what's so cool about your project is you've been at it for seven years and I think, you know, everyone knows that it, it's not easy to do that um, and we've been really excited to work with a long-standing project like you. You know, we're specifically working together to kind of reboot and fund the volunteer program that you have this year. So I share that just in case anyone thought she did all that with $5,000 because <laughs> she didn't, but um, we're really excited to be working together on that kind of like sustaining phase that honors all the work you and your team have put in over so many years and kind of helps you continue that because it's not only about the new projects, it's about supporting those ongoing projects too. So it's yeah. totally different than some of the new ones you'll hear, which I hope gives you a little balance of, of kind of the, the breadth of what you could hopefully do with an action award. So thank you for bringing that up, Julie. I was going so fast that I missed that, but the grant is helping us to reinvigorate the outreach and getting out the community because we did take that, we had a good momentum and then the hiatus of COVID. So now coming back and we got some really cool hats for swag to give at our next event. We have a table over there. So June 11th is our next uh, community day at the Pollinator Boulevard. So come by, it'll be really fun. I'll have hats and, uh, yeah, it'd be really, really cool to connect with everybody. Yes, please join us. Um, we're gonna hold questions until the end, I'm sorry, but I just wanna get to Lisa and then we'll, we'll have a session for questions at the end. Thank you. Wow, I think you've really made it when you get hate mail. You've been around long enough to be getting hate mail. Um, 
My name is Lisa Rogovin, and I live in Glen Park. We live on a street called Cuvier Street, or Cuvier Street, if you speak French. I don't, so I'll call it Cuvier Street. Um, and we are on a dead-end block that um, hits up to San Jose Boulevard. So there's a retaining wall at the end of Cuvier Street. And um, yeah, so we are, I say we, it's anybody who wants to show up and, and help out. Um, and that you know varies depending on what, who's available and what's going on in people's lives. This is the, the dead end that I referred to. This photo is from around July of 2021. Um, and you can see it's kind of an eyesore. Um, but what really had us take a closer, I've lived on the block for 10 years and I've been in San Francisco for 31 years. What really had us take a look at our neighborhood at the end of the street was, um, was last July. We noticed that there was a tent, and I, if it's popping in anybody's mind, this is not a political conversation, really. This is just wanting to use our space collectively as a community and feel safe. There were pit bulls, there were IV drug um, remnants, there's two and three year olds and 78 and 79 year olds. And we just, we, it just had us think about, could we do anything to, um, to make the space more usable for more people. A lot of people, we have a overpass over San Jose Boulevard, a pedestrian overpass. So there's a lot of people who walk on the block that are going into Glen Park or want to go to the BART station the other way. And so um, the gentleman in the photo is a representative for um, um, Mandelman, Raphael Mandelman, and he works with the, uh, police department, and he said something that really stuck with me, which was that cities die one block at a time, and so I felt like the city has been hit hard like everywhere around the world, every neighborhood, every city in this country from COVID, and we were just seeing it on our block that we were getting hit, and... Um, so I started talking with some neighbors and we have like a guardian angel here today who is in the audience who's been working on the Bernal Cut for many, many years and luckily um, took kind of an interest in, trying to, in helping us figure out how to do things to help the neighborhood. Yes, Sophie, woo! <laughs> Sophie's, I don't know if this is an overarching goal, but it really seems like Sophie's trying to unify the city with every, every neighborhood's effort, um, especially along the Bernal Cut into Glen Park. And so um, I think I passed a slide. Um, who are we? These are some of the neighbors who um, are just active and on the streets and talking to one another. We're city. We don't always talk to our neighbors. Some people think you're weird if you're talking to them, um, but COVID made us all, I, I think, take a, a look at wanting to get to know people who just happen to live two doors down. Um, the little girl in the upper left-hand upper left-hand corner and her father just started showing up um, to see what they can do to help and. Um, so these are some of the people who have been showing up to our monthly movie nights and monthly cleanups. Shine On SF's grant has allowed us to, um, to get the equipment that we need to activate the, the space. Um, so that's what we started out doing. We started out trying to find out who wanted to come to some movie nights. 
I never knew how to create a flyer or work in Canva or make a presentation. I was lucky enough to have other people help me do that, but there's no one doing that now other than me. But now I need to ask Shine on SF if they can do that to help me out because in order to have an event, you need to get the word out. And so that is something that is challenging to do because I have a business and two kids and um, I also really want our community to have these fun monthly events. So um, we were able to buy an outdoor, like the Ferrari of outdoor movie projectors and a portable screen and cool LED light up for nighttime cornhole and a mini ping pong table and a popcorn machine and coloring books and just trying to think about what's going to draw um, people from the ages of 3 to 85, 90 to come and, and hang out. And you can see we're, we're bundling up because it's San Francisco nights. Um, but that shouldn't stop us from coming together. Um, so the monthly movie nights happen. We are now experiencing the longest days of the year, and we cut our noise off at 10 o'clock. So um, for our May event, which is on May 21st, next Saturday, come, come hang out. We'll have a, an hour and a half of a band playing for us, and then we're going to do um, just order in pupusas from the corner store and play a short film until, you know, the end of the night has to, unfortunately, come to an end. Then the day after our movie nights, we've just moved it to the following day. We were doing cleanups and then movie night. We're doing movie nights and then on separate day cleanups because the few of us that have been doing the cleanup are having like heat exhaustion and um, just trying to go from cleanup to setting up, you know, one of our neighbors gave me his garage code so that I can connect an, um, a, an extension cord. So just setting up the movie night right, right after the cleanup. Um, I've put my daughter to work, she's 11 years old, but I have to say, it, I feel so satisfied because she wants to be a part of it. She wants to know when the cleanup is happening and she wants to be a part of it, she feels good about being a part of something that's happening um, in her community. So I didn't expect that to happen because she's 11 and I don't know, she's very into her friends and social things. Um, none of her friends are coming to this and she doesn't care who else is showing up. So I'm very happy about that outcome. Um, what else can I say? I mean, the, the wall you saw that had all the different variations of gray. Um, our neighbor, Mike, he covers the graffiti every single day and um, is out there um, doing all the labor and anything that, you know, we need to have done. He's the first one to sign up. Yeah. Yay, Mike. And then Ruth, um, who is up against the wall there. Um, this is right at the Glen Park BART station. We're kind of diagonal from the Glen Park BART station. This is the base of Bosworth Street and Lyle. Um, Bosworth would go uh, cross over Mission. Just trying to give you some perspective. I have the worst sense of direction, so I don't even know if I'm describing that well enough. But um, this is an area that is, um, it, it's just overgrown with ivy and fennel, and a lot of people see it every single day. And so we want people to, um, to see something that doesn't have trash stuck in it, and there's all sorts of problems there right now. And Sophie has brought us in to a larger conversation with the Department of Public Works to look at it, uh, to, to have the muscle of um, the Department of Public Works behind it to help us deal with it on that level. So thank you so much, maybe no more heat exhaustion. 
Um, yeah, so this is what's coming up May 21st, June 11th, July 9th. Those are movie nights, and we have cleanups the following day. And I hope to continue doing this and, until, I don't know, until who knows what. But every month it would be nice to keep coming together to see my neighbors. Hello. Well, speaking of trash, <laughs> we're going to talk about more trash. Um, so by a quick show of hands, how many people have heard or been to Manny's Cafe? Okay, Manny's crowd. Um, if you haven't been to Manny's Cafe, you need to change that effective immediately. Um, but I will tell you who we are. So we are a civic gathering space located on 16th and Valencia in the heart of the Mission District. We focus a lot on civic programming, but we also do a little of everything. So last week we hosted a dating game. Um, yesterday, or a couple days ago, we had music in the space. We're having sign making for protests. You name it, we do it. And part of that also means we pick up trash because we care about our neighborhood and we want the space to be cleaner. There we go. So why do we pick up trash? Well, as a small business, right, it's not that effective to have trash outside your front door and people trying to step over bags of last night's pad thai when they want to come to an event with Cory Booker. Not a cute look. <laughs> but on top of that, right, as a community member, we want to be proud of our streets. We want to be proud of the beautiful space that we occupy. The Mission District is this beautiful historic place that people come all around the world to come visit, and it means a lot for us to be taking up space there. I live in the Mission District. I want to be proud of where I live and work. And so that's why we said, how can we do something and what can we do? Um, Philip mentioned earlier, right, the kind of bureaucracy sometimes slows this stuff down. That's what we were seeing with trash cleanups, and so we said, let's take charge. And at first, it was only once a month. We started it back in August, and we kind of realized, like, okay, once a month, it's a cute gathering. You meet people, you get people together. That's fun for an hour, but, like, it's not leading to effective change. So we now do it every single week on Sundays from 10 to 11. And the outcome has been amazing to watch. I have been working at Manny's for three months, maybe four months almost, um, and I've been leading these trash pickups since I started, and we've built this little family network. I like to say it's a good old-fashioned Sunday gathering, right? So everyone comes together, we come pick up trash, we put on Donna Summer, it's a disco trash pickup, let me emphasize the disco. We put on Donna Summer, we're dancing at 10 a.m., we've bedazzled all of our uh, safety vests with disco balls, so you might get blinded, but like in a good way. You get little disco scrunchies, like the whole nine yards. And it's built this community where we have people who are coming back consistently every single day. But not even that, we have people who are coming back, going for the first time by themselves, meet a group of friends, and then they come back and it's become this tradition with these two strangers who are now becoming best friends. We've had relationships, I think, come out of this. I know, it's the new dating scene apparently. We've had jobs come out of this, and so it's turned out to be around 20 to 30 consistent folks that come every single Sunday. And we've also done this through partnerships with local businesses. So we've partnered with 10 plus local businesses across Valencia Street that offer special discounts every single Sunday to people who come attend our trash pickups. So yeah, I, everyone take note, this is like even more incentive to come. So if you come to a trash pickup, not only are you making your community more beautiful, doing amazing things, listening to great music, meeting cool people, you also get a list of free things. So free drinks, free hot chocolate, free food. We serve brunch and uh, shout out to Shine On and SF. Their grant has allowed us to do free brunch with Farming Hope, our partners at Manny's. So you can even brunch afterwards. So it's 10 out of 10. I'm gassing us up a lot. Um, <laughs> And this has been really inspiring because now we have people who want to do this in their own neighborhoods who are so inspired by what we're doing. They even have come up to me and they're like, can I take it over? Like, you don't need to come. I'll do it. You don't, like, stay home. Go do something on your Sunday. I want to run. Yeah, go brunch somewhere else. I want to run your trash pickup, um, which is 
which I'm like, okay. Um, but it's becoming a really powerful to see this group of like 20 to 30 consistent people talk about how they can do it in their own neighborhood or how they can take it up maybe on a, not on a Sunday, but on a Saturday or be, do something monthly, which is super exciting. And these are all the amazing people that come by. Look how beautiful they are. Um, so yeah, we have roughly 15 to 30 people come. We pick up a lot of trash. We pick up like minimum 30 bags of trash every single Sunday. Um, that's not a lot. Like, our streets are not a lot, so we do eight, 16th to 18th on Valencia, and then down to Mission Street, and then the alleyways in between. So it's not a huge area, but it's a lot of trash that we're picking up. And here's a cute little before and after. So before, right, last night's pad thai, who knows what else is in those bags, and then after, it's clean. And now when you want to like come into Manny's or go into the neighborhood businesses, you don't have to step over trash to go get your coffee. Um, but these are all the amazing people. We have over 10 small businesses. Paula in that corner with the fabulous glasses is holding our gift certificates that we hand out and you get free yoga classes too. Uh, I know, I'm, I'm really pushing it right now. Um, yeah, see, everyone come, free brunch every Sunday. But yeah, this is a really powerful thing we've been doing. It's something small, but it's something super impactful. And part of the reason why it's become so successful is because of this grant and because of the community making we're able to do through it. But that's all. Thank you so much. It, do, yeah, I can take the clicker back. Um, amazing, and we're excited to um, have some time for questions here. I'm just gonna put up um, all of our names and emails and um, just at the top, you have uh, our handle for Shana Nessa for Instagram and the website, so you can find out more about it. Um, just to kind of recap, that we will we, on our website right now. We do just we have a sign up. You can be first to be notified when we launch applications, but that will happen in June. So I think now we'd love to just open it up. Um, you know, questions from the group. Do we have Do we have any? I might because we can also ask our. We can kind of do some question starters if nobody wants to be the first guinea pig. But okay, so I'm going to. Um, I get, Julia's got a question too. Okay, let me be the, um, I'm going to sacrifice a mic to you. Yes, I am. And then I can kind of pass it around as we go. If you just want to say your name and then ask your question. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, Fran Martin from um, Visitation Valley. And I really applaud what you're doing. It's great. But you have a, a different population than we have. There's no way we could get this kind of thing going. You know, you, it's probably younger, although there's probably older people like myself. I've been volunteering for, what, years. And, and I, <laughs> decades, yeah. And, I, and I, I really applaud, as I said, you're doing it and other people here doing it. But I'm also kind of pissed off that the city isn't stepping up and doing their job. And I would like to see us Nothing to do with you. This is more like DPW and an attitude that we will take up the slack. It's up to us to take care of what they should be doing. And so I, while I hope everybody will, you know, do follow your lead, I would also hope that we would start advocating for the city to do its job. I second Thanks, that. Thanks, <laughs> Oh, yeah, go ahead. I why don't you guys take it first and I can add no, some I, color? No, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. And, and I think that, yes, right? DPW should be doing a lot of this. And where are they? And we have had issues with them as well with, you know, just trying to get irrigation. We've had to hand irrigate, bring a hose across the street from Whole Foods to do this by ourselves. Like, it takes hours because somehow it's impossible for DPW to turn on the irrigation. And so, you know, there's, there's things like that. So I totally support what you're saying and second that. But at the same time, I, I also feel like, well, y you know, yes, DPW should be doing something. But I, I just feel like I don't want to be just sitting around and not do something. And you've done that. Like, you're a volunteer, so you know that. But it's like we love our city, and I want to see it become the best thing that it can become. Yeah, and I, I don't know, Angelina, if you, because you're such a, I don't know, I know Manny just actually wrote an op-ed about this topic, so I don't know if you want to comment on it. I, I do want to um, say, no, I think it's a, it's a totally fair point to, to bring, and I think um, 
you know, we, we are at this moment, like obviously I'm, I currently work for the city, but you know, I've, I've had different hats and I'm also, you know, have been a resident, right? I've, I've been from a lot of sides and I think it's, you know, it's partly just that we, we have this moment where, you know, everyone has a role to play. And, um, you know, I, I will say that Public Works has been really engaged in, you know, they, we don't do a cleanup unless they're on board to pick up the trash, right? I mean, you could have the best of hearts out there and piling the bags and they sit on the corner. Like, that wouldn't work either, right? So I think we all are trying to kind of figure out, um, you know, how each of these entities can play their right role and, and we can kind of get to the outcome we, we want to get to, which is a cleaner and more cared for city. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's fair for, for all the perspectives to have, you know, maybe frustration that, that one person's not filling in more of a role than, than you know, we, we might want them to do. But I think um, we're kind of hoping through these projects and through ongoing collaboration, we can create models that can that can kind of put that best foot forward and it's it's just sort of a constant improvement process. I mean, that's just sort of the, the reality of it. I don't know, Angelina, if you want to comment on that anymore or we go to another question. No, I think you, everyone said it perfectly, but yeah, I guess from my perspective, right, um, as a small business, the, if we don't take action and if we wait constantly, then that is going to affect our business. So sometimes, you know, it's like a rock in a hard place. It's like, Right, like we shouldn't be having to do this. I shouldn't have to paint the electrical box that's being graffitied every day. Like that's not really my responsibility. But at the same time, it's like, I don't wanna look at it. So I'm just gonna go grab the paint can and I'm just gonna do it and like, let's try and make the most out of it while the bureaucracy figures itself out and hopefully can speed up and work itself out. Okay, let's take another question. Sophie, right? Okay, hello. Well, I, I like this vein, uh, Sophie Constantino, hi. Um, I, I, one of my uh, challenges has been how can we partner with OWD, Shine On, you're saying like these are resources we can, we can help you advocate, so how can OWD help us normal, you know, citizens then get Public Works or Rec Park or the different departments to actually collaborate with us and move the, move the needle in a positive direction? Because I think that there is, you do have connections, right? You do know a few people. So how can we advocate for you to help broker better relationships? That's a lot of pressure, sorry about that. <laughs> no, no problem, and I'll just, um... No, I mean, I think, I think it's a good, it's a, it's a thing, for example, you know, Patricia, it's a, been a topic when we started working together, Patricia is, you know, interested in, in getting this action award because you're interested in kind of re-kicking up your volunteer program in this year, but also you've been, you know, working on irrigation and trying to get that reestablished. So there's oftentimes, you know, sometimes the, you may have some like long-term goals that, that n no one may love it, but it can take a while to work through the city, something like that's more capital, you know, infrastructure-wise, or, or maybe a, a major change in the way that things are done, trash is picked up. I mean, some of these things are, are big things, but there's things we can do in the meantime that keep engaging people and certainly helps keep that momentum going in that right direction, right? So, so I think that's part of it too. Um, okay, do you have another question? I, I wanna take a little piece of this to um, just to say, you know, we, we view it as really the heart center of our role, um, the staff of the Parks Alliance and particularly my stewardship team to think about all the ways that we can bubble up um, and represent and advocate for the needs of community-based stewards of public space. And so, you know, really I think today the community partner network, our work together has actually this huge potential and, and we see it made real in, in certain avenues to make sure that elected officials, city agencies, and others understand that these aren't isolated groups, right? We are actually a united group of mission-aligned organizations who have a lot of similar needs. And, you know, it's our, you know, I think we've made great headways in certain eras of, you know, of decreasing the barriers to, to getting things done. The, the, the fact that we have 90 groups right now that are able to operate across a broad swath of public space in San Francisco is an accomplishment, but there's still a lot left to be done. And so just speaking for the Parks Alliance, I wanna say, you know, this collab deep collaborative work with the city is exactly related to that because, because what this program really is about is saying, how can we have these kinds of projects, you know, uh, at, at a variety of different stages re receive this albeit small amount of funding, but
but hopefully funding that can be catalytic and that's actually delivered in a way that's thoughtful about what, what could result from this. What are the kinds of relationships that could be strengthened from this? What are the models that we can kind of highlight through this work? And that's done very intentionally from our side with our partners in the city to try and make sure that opportunity across the city is richer for groups, whether you've been doing it for 20 years or two months. You know, we wanna make sure that, that the, the kind of people that are in this room, you know, have the best opportunity to just lean into what they want to accomplish in public space with the, with the lowest barrier possible. Thank you, Philip. Um, Julia, can we, are, you've got a, a burning question that we can pass it to our friend here. Sorry, I'm being the mic passer here, trying to go fast. Hi, I'm Julia. So, you know, I work a lot, um, you know, don't have as many hours in the day as some folks who volunteer, not even sure where to start. Do you have technical assistance available? And if so, what kind? What do you, what do they do? Yes, it's a good question. Um, so we recognize, I think, you know, money is one thing that helps you get your project done, but sometimes, like we said, you know, it might be help permitting, help working with a city agency, um, help marketing or, you know, recruiting volunteers. And so we are trying to bake in the technical assistance aspect of the award as well. So um, those things go hand in hand and what that looks like would really vary based on your project and your needs. So it's definitely a part of the program. Do we have another question somewhere in that table? Okay, sure. Hi, I'm gonna pass you the mic. Just let us know your name and then you can say your question. Hi, I'm Abby Ellis. I'm from uh, UC San Francisco and I do community relations for them. So I'm just curious to hear more about how you have this idea for a goal, an event, a project. How do you then do the engagement to reach out to your neighbors or the local community or businesses? What's been successful? What hasn't been? And then how do you sustain that? Thank you. I, I have two months into this. I'm just wondering, so the two month um, into it answer is, um, created a Google group and went around and neighbors who talked to neighbors said, if you want to be a part of putting a mural up and maybe developing a garden and just doing something in this neighborhood for, for us all, just give us your email address. So that was how we started to develop a group that we could send emails to. Um, and then created flyers that would just get posted, um, working with Refuse Refuse and Together SF and um, helping, getting their help to promote any kind of cleanups so that we can reach more eyeballs and hopefully get a couple more people. Um, as of right now, that's the extent of just when the event is happening, people will walk by and then we'll talk to them about when the next event is happening and ask them if we can get their email address. I started an Instagram page for it, um, at Cuvier Commons. Um, that might be the extent of how we're involved with engaging um, and getting attention. And it's still very, very premium, like, preliminary, we're not very well known yet, but. Gotta start somewhere. <laughs> start somewhere. <laughs> um, Patricia or um, Angelina, I don't know if you wanna chime in. At the beginning, uh, to get the project started, I had to do community outreach. It was part of the process that DPW um, asked me to do in order to allow us to take over the space. So initially I reached out to the businesses that are right there, so Whole Foods and then Prado Group, which is the building, uh, residential uh, building above it. And we met with all the residents there, with not, not all of them, but we, you know, we put an a, a poster and the ones that came. And then we also met with the neighborhood, uh, neighborhood group, which later I became a board member. Um, and so Reaching to the neighborhoods, groups that are already established, the residents, the businesses, and 
same thing. I have a you know spreadsheet where I have all the emails, and whenever we have an event, we put a poster, we put it in our social media, we have an Instagram account, a Facebook account, and send it out to that group of email lists. And you know, Whole Foods as a partner always puts up a little poster in their store. Prado Group puts a poster. We are now with um, Shine SF. We're you know, hoping that we can incentivize this by reaching out to other um, media, getting other media blasts, like maybe um, Bloom SF, um, putting it out there, putting the word to a wider audience, and then also reaching out to new businesses, because some of the businesses have changed, so getting the new businesses around the neighborhood to also put advertisements, come out, and yeah, hopefully, get it all re, um, re-established again and continue that momentum. Um, I will say quickly is I, um, not to be political, politics, I know we had a little of that, um, but I treat it almost like a campaign. So if you've ever worked on a campaign, right, there's door knocking um, and there's just calling people up and cold calling people. And so that's kind of how we've treated it on top of just marketing on our social medias and being partnered with Together SF. Um, Manny, shout out to him, has an amazing Rolodex and just started walking the neighborhood and talking to the local businesses and being like, hi, I'm picking up trash, this is gonna help you. Do you wanna participate? How can, what can you offer? Can you tell people who are coming in? So I, would, I think of it as a like, political campaign. Cold call people, knock doors, say hello, and make it as inviting and as exciting as you can. Thank you, can't be shy. Philip. I don't know if we have time for one more. Are we at the, at the end? Okay, we're at the end. So thank you all so much for coming and, and thank you to our panelists for sharing your work. Um, we hope this is just the beginning of this program. We hope that uh, many of you will be inspired to apply. I know you're working on excellent and amazing, um, impactful projects in your community. So um, we hope to get to work with you through this program. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.